Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome to the BC Forage Fish Monitoring Network, uh, the annual virtual symposium, uh, future directions for forage fish monitoring, getting the most from community science data. Uh, we really welcome you to this evening's presentations. Uh, we have a great lineup of, of different folks, um, both from kind of professional panelists to uh, leaders of, the, of a few select stewardship groups. Um, my name is Kyle Armstrong. I'm the Restoration Coordinator for Peninsula Stream Society. Um, and Stephanie Lane from Project Watershed, uh, a project manager and researcher with Project Watershed, will be your moderator this evening. Um, and we'd like to begin the evening by um, giving Ian Bruce, the, uh, the Executive Coordinator of Peninsula Streams and a co-chair of the newly established BC Forge Fish Monitoring Network, uh, the floor here just to, to get us rolling for the evening. Ian. Thanks, Kyle. Um, that's great. You're all here tonight. That's a great turnout. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I'm living and working on the unceded lands of the Coast Salish peoples known as the Wasanich or the Saltwater people, as they are known in their Sinchothan language. So next slide, we have the agenda here. Um, you can look through it. The speakers, Jacqueline Huard, uh, Cliff Robinson, and, and Philip Dion. And then we're going to have presentations from the members on what the groups are doing. And then prizes. Uh, next slide, please. So the BC Forge Fish Monitoring Network was begun officially about 15 months ago with the support of funders, in particular um, Sitka Foundation, and the encouragement of other groups such as the World Wildlife Fund and their staff, and the Pacific Salmon Foundation. So thanks to uh, all of you. Um, However, the seeds of this network began almost 20 years ago um, with the extensive survey work undertaken by volunteers led by almost single-handedly by Ramona de Graff. Um, and the, uh, I guess it's the Sea Watch Society was her society that she was, she was uh, running and operating under. So I was introduced to Forge Fish by her in 2012 and have been captivated ever since. Um, so as well, I believe the members of the network uh, also uh, uh, debt of gratitude to pioneers such as Dan Patilla, Philip Dion, and others in Washington State, as well as many of you that are here tonight from British Columbia and elsewhere. So on that note, uh, I think we can go to the next slide. So the members currently are Project Watershed, Peninsula Streams, Mount Aerosmith uh, Biosphere, Biosphere uh, Reserve Initiative, or MABRI as we call them, Loon Foundation, Tsleil-Waututh, Tsleil Parks Canada, Sunshine Coast, Friends of Forge Fish, Redfish Restoration Society, and the Friends of Samyamu Bay. So we're all around the Salish Sea as well as on the West Coast now, Vancouver Island. And we'd like to support forage fish monitoring throughout coastal British Columbia. Next slide, please. So this year's achievements, um, founded the organization. We've had four meetings of the executive team, six member meetings, three new member groups have joined, two symposium events and one collaborative conference presentation. And we've engaged with five affiliate members, uh, many of you are here tonight, and we are um, waiting on an agreement with DFO for ag identification support and training. And that's probably would have been signed about today, but uh, for the strike that's going on now. So probably right after the strike or soon after the strike, we'll have that um, um, in hand. Uh, next slide, please. And again, we couldn't do what we do without our volunteers and community supporters and without our funders. So uh, there's a list of our funders here amongst uh, many others. So thank you. And I'm gonna turn it back to Kyle. Thanks, great, Ian. Uh, a couple more housekeeping items, uh, especially now that we're, we're getting a more of a solid number of, of folks who have just joined us as well. Um, so we'll go through the evening. Each presenter will have around 10 minutes to present with followed by a question period. Um, please post your questions in the chat and Stephanie Lane, our wonderful moderator, will uh, bring them to the attention of our presenters. Um, we also uh, would really like to hear from uh, who's here tonight, who has done a uh, forage fish survey uh, ever. So please, you know, pop your name in the chat. 
if, uh, if you've ever been on one of these surveys, uh, we'd love to hear from you and just kind of get an idea of, of how many of our volunteers are, are watching us tonight. So um, that would be very much appreciated. Hey, Kyle, we've got an alert that the chat is disabled. Um, yeah. That might need permission from the host, please. Interesting. Okay. I uh, might have to work on that. Uh, <laughs> uh, maybe I'll do that while we, uh, we while we listen to our next presenter. Um, up next, we have Cliff Robinson uh, from DFO, who has uh, really done a lot in the terms of eDNA and uh, progressing our our what we know uh, about a lot of these species and 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 using this really important tool. Uh, to determine different different habitat use. And so we're very lucky to have uh, Cliff here tonight to tell us more about this work that he's done. And, and some of us have been lucky enough to participate in. So um, without further ado, I'm going to stop sharing my screen um, and we can uh, welcome Cliff uh, as our next presenter here. All right, thanks, Kyle. Um, now, for some reason, is that, am I sharing anything? It's kind of odd. Okay, it looks like I just got kicked out, Kyle, when I was trying to share. Let me try this again. I'm not sure what happened there. <clears throat> so how come this works? Hmm. Let me know if you... In practice. <laughs> yeah, I don't... Uh... Are you able to share your screen? You want to give it a try? Yeah, I can't... Uh... Hmm. No, it's not letting me for some reason. Do you still have it? Uh... Hmm. I've tried entire screen and the window and neither one is um, letting me share. You can't see anything, obviously. No, we can't. Hmm. So I'm not really sure what's going on here. So, Hmm. I'm going to maybe uh, try, I'm going to leave maybe and try and reconnect. Yeah, sorry about this. Uh, oh, it's, uh, yeah, I don't know. It, it was working in the practice. Um, well, it worked. Yeah, it worked fine. So I'm not sure because I just click on the window or the screen and nothing's happening. So if you want, Cliff, <clears throat> um, you could also send it to me as a backup and I could run through it. Like I'll present now. And then while I'm presenting, you could also send it to me. Yeah, why don't we try that? I'm gonna I'm gonna leave and then I will email it to you, Jack. Okay. It's eleven. Okay. I think it's only eleven megabytes or something, but okay. Hopefully okay. my screen share will work. <laughs> Is that yeah, right if, if I go ahead. Yeah. Okay, so I should see my screen. Wonderful, and <laughs> thanks for doing that, that, that Jack. Appreciate no worries. It. Okay, I presume you're seeing the right thing, my slide. Yes, that looks great. Wonderful, okay. So, uh, hi everyone, my name is Jacqueline Heward. I'm a UBC grad student. I'm very close to finishing this master's. Defense date set for May 24th. Um, my supervisors are Tar Martin and Cliff, who we'll hear from later. I've titled this presentation, Burying Our Heads in the Sand, I hope you like a pun, The Population Trajectory and Threats to Salish Sea uh, Pacific Sandlands. So, like many habitats in our region, some of the sandlands intertidal habitats owe their pure existence to the traditions and protections of Indigenous peoples. I want to recognize that the work that I've done took place 
in the traditional and unceded territories and homes of well over 100 different Indigenous groups across the Salish Sea. Some of these include the Wisanich, the Weiwei Kam, and the Comox First Nations. I um, am an uninvited guest here in uh, the traditional and unceded territories of the Staminas First Nation, pretty close to Ladysmith. And so I'm, yeah, so data deficient, what does that mean? I'm, I study a species that there's not a lot of information about and making decisions about a data deficient species is really difficult. Sandlands are data deficient species. If you uh, go onto the Web of Science, which is sort of like Google for research papers, um, and you pop in Pacific Salmon, 8,000 papers show up. And so these have gone through that peer review process and are, are pretty good research. If you pop in Pacific Herring, 1,500 or so papers pop up. And if you pop in uh, Pacific Sandlands, only 173 papers show up. So it's not a lot. And this is what I mean by burying our heads in the sand. We've kind of neglected to focus on this unsexy species, and yet they support an entire ecosystem. And so the problem with being data deficient is that little research and management resources are spent on data deficient species. You know, if, if it's not a problem, don't fix it. You know, people aren't focused on it because we don't even know what's going on with the species. And ultimately this translates to, there's no habitat maps showing where the species are. There's no best management practices that guide uh, project proponents or people doing construction work. There's no requirement to alter a construction timeline, say for a port or a marina um, that would mitigate for their presence. And yet sand lance are incredibly important contributors to our ecosystem. They have over hundred known predators. Um, they're a favorite, they're particularly important to lingcod, to Chinook salmon and seabirds, particularly during chickering season. So like other forage fish species, sand lance act as bridges and they move uh, energy from those zooplankton, those tiny small uh, animals up to the big predators that we really care about that that drive our economies and, and our cultures. And so without sand lance in the middle or other forage fish to eat those tiny things, you don't have that connection to the rest of the ecosystem. And so some of this is my, my motivation for this project and it's to help identify the population trajectory for sand lance and identify the key threats. And then this way we'll have more information for conservation decision makers like the people at DFO who approve permits or um, people at the province who are looking at various legislation and, and where to put, say, an important bird area um, on a species that's important to the ecosystem and yet understudied. So in order to do this, I worked with experts and I conducted an expert elicitation. So this is a very specific way of asking experts for their opinion. And I did this by conducting surveys. I used uh, an all digital version of something called the IDEA protocol, which is a set of guidelines for being fair and as unbiased as possible when you work with expert opinion. And so for my project, it worked like this. First, I recruited as diverse a group of experts as I could. And you can imagine there's not a lot of people that study Sandlands, so I did my best. Next, I investigated, which meant that I clarified exactly what we were gonna do. And then when I gave the survey, I did it in a really, in a, in a private and individual manner. So I avoided a group setting. I just did it where everyone was on their own at first. And when I asked these experts for their opinions, I first always asked them for their best guesses. That's the dot in the middle of this image. And then I also asked them for some intervals, meaning I asked them for their lowest possible guesses and their highest possible guesses. And then I also asked them for any confidence they had on top of that about the whole question. Next, I aggregated the results, so I put them all together, and then I did some show and tell where everyone could see them. And then I allowed people to give feedback on their responses and to discuss them amongst the experts. And then I redid that process um, where I put the estimates back together, re-showed it to everybody, and they had a final opportunity to revise. And then I touched the data. So, um, Again, I looked at two things. What, what's the population status and what are the threats? And so quickly I'm gonna run you through the population status. And although I wanted to identify the threats, I, I wanted to know since I was asking experts for their opinion anyways, how they thought sandlands are doing. 
I wanted to ask this because there's no existing stock assessment for sand lands. We really have no idea if their populations are increasing or in decline or doing great, or maybe they just fluctuate. Uh, and so this is the actual question that I asked them. I said, imagine a well-designed sampling program and that it has occurred annually across the Salish Sea. And over the last five years, these great scientists have determined the average sample of sand lance to be 100 fish. Here's 100 fish. Then I said, now imagine the sampling program is undertaken in 25 years in the same locations using the same methods by the same great scientists. Compared to today, how similar will the average sample of sand lance be? And this is, these are the results. So on average, what you're seeing um, and actually, I'll just step back. So the participants, individual participants are on the bottom and they're using pseudonyms. So like code names. And then their guess for how the population is doing is on the Y axis, the vertical axis. And the dot is the best estimate. And um, what we see is that most people's best estimates are at or below the no change line. So the no change line is that red line at 100, meaning that there's a predicted decline to Pacific Sandlands populations in 25 years from today under a business as usual scenario. The group mean for best guesses is 65 and the confidence, so the lowest and highest possible estimates ranges from zero at the bottom all the way up to a thousand at the top. Only one participant estimated that their best guess is that the population might increase, meaning I have 24 experts who all think that the population of Pacific Sandlands in 25 years from today in the Salish Sea is either gonna be the same, or you can see most of those dots are closer to 50, not gonna be doing very well. So in response to that question, what is the projected uh, trajectory of Salish Sea Sandlands? The picture that I'm seeing is a compelling expectation of a decline in sand lands with considerable uncertainty around exactly how much. So given that we're facing a biodiversity crisis, I personally am very interested in actions. Like let's make some change here. We can't take actions if you don't know what your problems are. So that's why we wanted to figure out what are the threats to Salish Sea sand lands and their habitats. So to answer this question, I used that same group of experts and I gave them two surveys. So I'm following that modified IDEA protocol. And in the first survey, I've determined what the experts collectively think the pressing threats are to sand lands. And in the second survey, I do a deeper dive and I conduct a vulnerability assessment and we'll talk about what that is. So here's the results of survey one. So here's the top 20 threats that I got. Um, and this is what we're going to use in survey three to take a deeper dive. So they range from kelp aquaculture and selfish aquaculture, beach recreation, um, dredging, there's pollution, port activities and um, repairing areas, sediment increased or decrease, shipping, shoreline armoring. So lots of threats here. So survey three, it's a more complex idea because the concept of vulnerability isn't simple. Some define vulnerability as the potential for loss, while others define it as the possibility for future harm. Most of the definitions I came across agree that vulnerability is a function of exposure. That is, how often does a threat occur? How long does it last for? Across how much area does it exist? And resilience. So that is... How much or how well can a species resist changing in the face of a given threat? So I use those two qualifiers to gather more information about each threat, those, all those 20 threats. And I broke these down into three questions for exposure. You know, what is the spatial scale of each threat? And I have them answer that for every threat. How long does it last? And how often does it occur every year? And then for resistance or resilience, I have it as one question. How will sand lands resist changing in the face of the threat? And so each of these questions I'm calling a vulnerability measure because together they measure how much sand lance and their habitat is vulnerable to a given threat. This is what the um, this is like what the, the questions look like for each threat. So they have a specific and clear drop-down list that they have to choose from. 
And then once I have the averages for each vulnerability measure for each threat, I calculate a vulnerability score and I use this equation, which is essentially just um, uh, I, I multiplied every vulnerability measure by a weight and then I added it together for each threat. And then this way I can come up with a relative comparison of threats. So I can just compare them relatively speaking. Here are those results. So uh, the relative vulnerability value is on the y-axis and it ranges from zero to one. The threats are listed at the bottom in order of highest to least and CC means climate change. Overall, we see climate change, sea level rise, sea temperature rise and extreme weather are the top three followed by microplastics and shoreline armoring. So shoreline armoring is any hard structure placed on the shore. So think of like the Stanley Park seawall. Kelp aquaculture, beach recreation, salmon aquaculture, urban wastewater pollution, and riparian shoreline vegetation loss are the threats with the lowest five scores. Stepping back, there's a lot of threats here. Sandlands are facing death by a thousand cuts. So this was a fast presentation and it's still a little bit long. We found that sandlands are predicted to decline and are facing death by a thousand cuts. And yet this is subject to much uncertainty. Perhaps you could interpret this uncertainty as hope for a resilient species sharing a world with humans that are motivated to change. Uh, the top threats include climate change, microplastics, and shoreline armoring. We now know more about threats to sandlands and their habitats and, and that what they face and, and how their population is expected to fare. So it's more than just a bleak prediction and a list of threats, but a deeper, more thoughtful breakdown of some of the most impactful human activities on this important species. There are many more questions to answer, um, but this is an important starting place for organizations looking to make effective contributions to conservation, looking for guidance on what to do. And if nothing else, it's a justification for those that are already taking actions and a great backup for them. Thank you to everyone who, all the experts I worked with and, and all the great collaborators I've learned from. Thank you for listening. I maybe have two minutes for questions. Maybe, maybe one minute or so. Uh, we are just about at 10 minutes now. So if anyone has questions for Jack, uh, please put them, you can use the little Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen, um, or, and that way we can uh, keep track of all the questions. Um, and one that just came in, Jack, is what is the best, or where is the best beach that you have seen? Ooh, um, I mean, good question. There's a lot of great beaches. Um, you know, Sydney Spit and James Island are some of the best sandlands habitat in the Southern Salish Sea. Um, but, you know, so is Goose Spit. They're up there for trying to compete for best beach. So, yeah. <laughs> a lot of good beaches. Um, and then we'll do one more question. And then in the interest of time, I think we'll have to move on. But um, what would you say would be the best conservation measure to reduce all of these threats? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, yeah, like protect habitat. Um, Conserve habitat, not protect it, conserve it. Yeah, because sandlands are nothing without their burrowing and, and spawning grounds. Right. Um, and I think, uh, Kyle, can um, panelists also answer questions? Yeah, absolutely. If someone wants to jump in, please do. Um, yeah. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. I mean, uh, there's some questions starting to pile up in the Q&A. So maybe, Jack, you could go through and answer those um, yeah. for folks. And that way we can move on and hear from Cliff. Oh yeah, uh, Jack. If you if you can't do that, let me know. <laughs> no, I can't. I downloaded his presentation. It's open. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, guys, for doing that. Sorry, I don't know what happened, but uh, they these things do happen. They do happen in in, in the Zoom. Well, there you go. In practice, it was all great. So <laughs> I guess while I'm waiting for the presentation to start, uh, I just thought I'd maybe quickly introduce myself. So. For those of you that don't know me, I'm a research scientist with Fisheries and Oceans at the Biological Station in Nanaimo. And um, 
No, oh, that's an interesting picture. Um, and my research really focuses on forage fish uh, habitat in particular, uh, modeling and field sampling. And so <clears throat> a couple of years ago, we got interested in using environmental DNA, and that's what I'm going to talk about uh, tonight. And so this was in discussion with uh, Karen Helbing's uh, Karen Helbing at uh, U of X, who is a environmental DNA uh, specialist. And so what I'm just going to present here over the next uh, 10 minutes is basically a review of a paper that we just had recently published on application of uh, eDNA or environmental DNA as a tool for detecting intertidal habitat use by sand lance and surf smell. And so the bottom of this screen on the left there is the, uh, this is published in Ecological Indicators and there's an HTPPS um, link to the paper so you can at some point, I guess we can copy that out or whatever, but if, you, if you're more interested in the details. So I've listed the authors here. So several from UVic, uh, Jack from UBC, and Jennifer Sethras, who used to work with uh, Project Watershed. Uh, next, please, Jack. So the sort of overarching uh, research objective for the paper and also some of our other research projects it really was to, first of all, determine if eDNA would be a feasible tool for helping to identify sandlands habitat and surf smell habitat. And we were interested in intertidal, obviously, in this, uh, in this example, but I just I, I need to mention that we are also doing quite a bit of work looking at in uh, shallow subtitle as well, especially for bur as burying habitat. And so ultimately, you know, this kind of research is leading to, we're hoping it's going to lead to uh, help us better understand some of the temporal and spatial variabilities that we see in, in habitat use. And then ultimately, we want to be able to use this uh, tool, this environmental DNA tool, as basically a validator for some of the habitat models. Um, Jack has done a lot of work on, uh, on an intertidal spawn habitat model for sandlands. We also have some other models as well. So we're hoping that it, we can use it uh, in that sense. Uh, next one, please. So before I uh, just quickly go through that paper and what we did, it's really important to recognize that a lot of people have been involved uh, over the last few years, um, particularly the last uh, the two winters that we were um, interested in, in terms of helping us collect sand samples, both for visual egg analysis, but also um, paired with uh, smaller sand samples for environmental DNA analysis at U of X. And so I've just listed uh, hopefully most of the the groups that have been involved one way or the other, and obviously many individual community scientists have been involved. And so I just want to give a shout out to everybody here. Uh, next slide, please. So just very quickly, uh, what is environmental DNA? It's important for everyone to recognize I'm not an eDNA specialist by any stretch of the imagination. I'm a fish ecologist, habitat ecologist. So I learned a lot about using environmental DNA. Um, so hopefully you don't have any really specific questions about the processing because that really is why Karen Hilding's lab was obviously involved. They, they are truly the experts in this. But it's basically any environmental, or sorry, any DNA that is released into the environment. So we can be talking about feces or mucus, or um, for some fish species, like particularly Pacific herring, shedding of scales, all sorts of things. Um, and then, so how do we detect it? So in this case, what we were obviously interested in collecting very small subsamples of sand and we followed the World Wildlife Fund and MABRI um, beach sampling method that they use for the like the transect sampling and the collecting of four liters of sand for the visual analysis. We, we followed the similar type protocol. And as I mentioned, just collected substantially smaller uh, amounts of sand, usually about a, 125 mils or a quarter of a cup of sand. So we're not talking about a lot of sand. So that sand is collected. It's typically frozen if we can't get it to Uvic right away. And then it's processed simply by adding water. Uh, to the sand sample, it's put into a bigger container, usually a couple of liters of water, distilled water, and it's given a really good shake, and then it's allowed to settle. And then UVic analyzes the filter, or the filtrate that's on the filter for uh, DNA, using something called qPCR. And the important point to make is that this is um, a process that is designed to detect a specific uh, one species, so in this case, uh, Pacific sandlands or a surf smell. There is another eDNA approach called metabarcoding, which is used to identify multiple species from a sample. Uh, next slide. 
So I'm just going to show sort of the three kind of, <clears throat> excuse me, important results from this work. One is about 101 different um, intertidal locations were sampled of these, about uh, half of them, 52 of them, had Sandlands D, uh, DNA detected at least once. Several of these beaches were sampled multiple times. Surf smelt DNA, which is uh, was detected on 10 different beaches, and that's represented by the little red uh, circles in this case, on this slide. And then uh, seven of those 10 had both uh, surf smelt as well as Sandlands uh, DNA. And so you can get a, a pretty good idea that with respect to uh, Sandlands DNA during the winter, so November to January in, in these two particular years, it's very well distributed all throughout the, uh, the Northern Sailor Sea. Uh, next slide, please. So <clears throat> just to focus on the little red box here, these are the samples. There was 181 of them that were uh, paired, as I mentioned, and I've already mentioned a couple of times with the visual egg sand samples that were collected by the various community groups and individuals. So of that 181, 141 of them did not have a visual detection of any eggs. In the case of eDNA though, about uh, 45 or 32% of those samples did have DNA detected, uh, Sandlands DNA detected. And then when we look at the 130 surf smelt samples or sand samples, no surf smelt eggs were detected, but seven or 5% of that 130 had surf smelt um, DNA detected. And then when we get down to um, samples that had more than two eggs for Sandlands, there were 27 of them where there was visual identification of two or more eggs in a sample. Um, there's a, a pretty high correspondence, almost a 90% correspondence between DNA detection for Sandlands as well as the visual egg detection. Uh, next uh, slide, please. So the last sort of key result I'm going to mention, again, you're welcome to uh, contact me or look up this paper because all this is it's described in a lot more detail than I have time for. But one of the things we were quite interested in is that there is a significant positive correlation between the visual egg counts for samples that contain at least two eggs and the what they call in the, in the environmental DNA business, they call it copies per liter. Um, and so there is a significant positive correlation, which is quite a a good and exciting find for us because I think a lot of eDNA people really are uh, hoping that um, things like fish abundances and such can be related back to eDNA uh, copies per liter. And I think that is still a pretty active, um, especially in marine systems, a pretty active field of research. So it was really nice to see that we did detect that with uh, respect to the examples. Next slide, please. So just very quickly, a couple, three more slides. Um, <clears throat> I just sort of listed here what I feel are sort of the benefits of environmental DNA and maybe reasons why it could be used in um, combination with visual sampling, visual um, detection of eggs and sand samples in the, in the future. Uh, number one, it's pretty easy to collect these samples. You can go out and, and do, you know, a large number of be beaches very, very quickly. As I mentioned, um, you're really only required to collect about a quarter, uh, like two or 175 to maybe 250 mils of sand. So between say a half or even uh, you know a cup of sand at the very most and on most beaches that's sort of 10 12 sort of smaller sub samples um, obviously this kind of a method uh, it really allows you to resample beaches so on several occasions we had about six beaches where we went back and resampled once a week over a period of um, probably six or seven weeks and so it's really interesting because you'll get no hit no hit and then all of a sudden you'll get the hit when the eggs start to show up on a beach for the DNA. Um, the, so I should also mention, so UVic has developed these uh, assays, these eDNA assays for the key PCR analyses of which Sandlance and Surf Smelt, which we've talked about. We also have uh, had them develop one for Pacific Herring and also Northern Anchovy. And so there is some, we're doing some additional work looking for detection of DNA by these species in various habitats. Uh, one of the benefits to qPCR versus say the metabarcoding uh, my understanding from, uh, from Karen is that qPCR has a very, um, it's very, very sensitive to detecting even small amounts of DNA. And they run, they have something called an integrity e-test, which they actually test the samples to make sure they pass a certain level of uh, quality before they're even analyzed. So UVic has put a lot of effort into making sure that the results, <clears throat> excuse me, from uh, eDNA samples are actually reliable and meaningful. 
And then finally, as I just shown a second ago, the relationship between the eggs um, visually detected in a sample versus the amount of DNA. We're quite excited with that and hope to move that forward again. Uh, next slide, please. So as with everything, there's always limitations. Um, some people, you know, in this group might think, well, a limitation is you can't distinguish the DNA, whether it comes from an egg or from a fish. From my perspective, it's habitat. Uh, on several instances during the winter, um, fish, uh, sand lance, usually young of the year, so usually less than about 90 millimeters in length, were actually found burying in the same intertidal habitat that we expected to find eggs. So, uh, you know, it's important that people recognize this. I'm interested in the detecting the DNA of this particular species in any given habitat. That tells me that habitat is of use uh, to the species and therefore we should be aware of it. Another potential limitation is the potential cost. Uh, we're anticipating this would go down um, through an organization like UVic, but commercial labs are also starting to get into this as well. Um, I think as more, um, as more interest is generated, cost will probably go down as, as you're dealing with volume numbers. Um, a big thing that we've been working on with UVic is a new method for, instead of collecting like one or you know a cup of sand and then doing all this filtering, it's very labor intensive, very time uh, intensive. And so Karen's lab has come up with an alternative method, which we have put into the um, into the hopper here to see if we were just testing it this past winter. So we're still waiting on the results, but that's very, we're very hopeful. And if it happens, it'll be uh, quite a bit cheaper and faster. Uh, I think one more slide, please. So quick messages. Um, for us, it really, you know, if there's uh, DNA on a beach, it really is telling us that there's a very high probability that that is being used by sand lance as some kind of habitat, whether it's for spawning or brewing. <clears throat> um, and the other thing, important point to make is just because a beach doesn't have sand lance DNA on it, or even surf smell DNA, it doesn't mean that that beach is in habitat because there's all these interannual variations in the population. Uh, sampling month becomes extremely important. We did a little bit of work also looking at eDNA through a full year, and it definitely disappears in the intertidal. So month is key. So if you're looking for spawning, everybody here knows you want to go out sort of mid-November to maybe mid-January or so. That's really kind of maybe the peak spawning period. Uh, as I also alluded to, uh, we've done, we've started to do and have done quite a bit of work on um, shallow uh, subtitle burring habitat for sandlands. We're, we're really trying to um, I'd be keen to move this forward, looking at spawning in, in the shallow subtitle because it's uh, quite common elsewhere, like in the North Sea. Um, and we're we're also moving this forward to the outer coast of west of uh, Vancouver Island and up into North Central uh, BC, up around Haida Gwaii and such. And Environment Canada and Parks Canada are quite keen in helping us sort of apply this uh, sampling and this process eDNA for identifying habitat. And I think it's important to recognize, we all know this, there's very few community groups in a lot of these other locations on the BC coast. So um, it's going to be challenging, but I think eDNA is going to, is really going to help us move our knowledge forward. And I think that's the last slide. Yeah, there you go. So there's my email if you have questions or if I think we have maybe a minute or so now. <clears throat> so I'll end it there. And, uh, Super. Yep. Thank you, Cliff. Um, yeah, that was super interesting. I don't know a lot about eDNA myself. Um, and we've got maybe a minute and a half or so here. Uh, there was a question a few minutes ago about um, is there, are there any future plans to create a stock assessment plan for the Pacific Sand Lance um, to get more quantitative data? Uh, well, I can, I can say that the answer to that is no, because stock assessment is, is in, from a DFO perspective, is um, only happens to a fish species. So sand lance does not have any kind of a fishery associated with it. Um, mm. So for instance, in the North Sea, they're heavily fished. And yes, there is a lot of uh, stock assessment work done on the, the, I mean, this is, I think Jack kind of mentioned this, they're, they're really a data deficient species in a lot of respects. So not just from a habitat use perspective, but population um, perspective is very, very challenging. Thank you. Um, there was also a question that I don't know if this goes beyond this, uh, the area of your expertise, but are there correlations um, or some way that you could compare tests of the eDNA in the sand um, to nearby sources of eDNA in the water? 
So I think it's yeah, getting at like, is there a relationship there? Yeah, for sure. There's a lot of, um, we have done eDNA testing in the water and we're actually um, uh, pursuing that more with acoustics. I mean, it, it's not directly answering the question. There's not necessarily any paired studies looking at water, you know, eDNA in the water that's over top of the sound. We haven't really gotten into that. There's a lot of questions <laughs> that can be, you know, this would require a lot of graduate students or very keen community scientists to start collecting and, and trying to, you know, assess some of these uh, very interesting questions, even things like how long does the DNA last within the sediment? Um, you know, there's been some work done in freshwater systems, but virtually nothing in the marine. So um, big challenges. And just out of, just one last comment, you know, in the shallow subtitle for eDNA, what we found is a lot of the samples uh, can, uh, when you take a, a, a subtitle sample using a grab sampler, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of times the sample is very, for some reason it gets contaminated. I use that word, but Uvic doesn't like me, Karen doesn't like me using that word, but in other words, there's some kind of in inhibition by something, a chemical or something in the subtitle sediments that's not allowing for DNA detection, as simple as, as it is in the inner title. So there's a, a massive, massive list. Somebody could probably spend a whole career just kind of trying to sort out all this stuff for a little old sand lance. <laughs> Excellent. Well, thank you. Uh, Stephanie, is that, is that it for time on that one? Okay, and just a reminder to the panelists that there's questions popping up in the Q&A, and uh, if we can't get to all of them, maybe we can just chip away at them in there as best as we can. And um, and yeah, hopefully we can get uh, some good discussion going in the Q&A. It looks like lots of really good questions. Um, next up, we have uh, Philip Dion. He's a senior research scientist at the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, his team is responsible for research and management of forage fish in marine waters throughout Washington's coast. So we're really happy to have uh, Philip here joining us and presenting. And um, yeah, take it away, uh, Phil. Thanks. Hopefully I can share my screen. All right, you guys, oh, wrong screen, I suspect. Is that not working for you either there, Phil? Um, I think I just grabbed the wrong screen. Hold on one second. Wonderful. Okay, how's that look? That looks great. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you very much for having me. I appreciate uh, the invitation. Uh, I always enjoy the opportunity to talk about forage fish. And uh, um, I'm part of our marine fish science unit here at the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, and I lead our forage fish research and management team. And uh, since I'm on the south side of the border from you guys, I feel like it's important to understand sort of our regulatory environment down here and how that has impacted how we do our forage fish surveys and sort of how we've gotten to where we are now. So um, just a few highlights here. Uh, in 1889, Washington became the 42nd state of the union. And the following year, the legislature passed an act that allowed the sale of the tide lands in Washington state. And uh, this has had long lasting ramifications for our shoreline development and conservation that we are still grappling with today. And also has really influenced how and why we do our work. Um, and so there's been a couple of acts since then have sort of recognized the impacts to our nearshore uh, habitats but uh, today, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife is responsible for administering our state's hydraulic code, which includes uh, a project approval process to promote the protection of fish life and habitat. And so that's a large part of the work that my team and I have been doing and uh, actually has been done here at Fish and Wildlife uh, since about the 1970s. 
And so one of the important things when trying to protect fish life and habitat is to first understand when and where those fish are. And uh, one of the habitats we've been most focused on is spawning habitat. So we have regulatory, regulatory authority to protect forage fish spawning habitat. And uh, in Puget Sound, this is namely our surf smell, our sand lance, and our herring. So the map I'm showing here is actually a, an online resource that's one of our major products um, uh, that documents and displays uh, all the known surf smell, sand lance, herring spawning areas throughout the Puget Sound. It's an interactive map that's available to the public. And this map's used both for permitting shoreline activities as well as uh, prioritizing restoration and conservation activities throughout the Puget Sound. Um, but underneath this map, uh, these layers or these line segments uh, is tens of thousands of survey points. Um, and so this is actually a layer that we, we also provide to the public showing all the individual uh, surveys that have been done since the 1970s to actually create that map. Um, because, uh, and you'll see that many of these areas have multiple points overlapping. And part of this is because we're not only interested in where these forage fish are spawning, but when they're spawning there. Um, which leads me to one of our, our major uh, challenges when it comes to doing forage fish research and monitoring in Washington State is capacity. Um, as Jack alluded to before, uh, some species get more attention and have more research than others, and forage fish, unfortunately, are sort of on the short end of the uh, funding and capacity element. And uh, we've learned through our years of research that it takes a lot of effort to document some of these beaches. And so uh, I'm very excited to hear some about the, of the work that Cliff has been doing with eDNA, because we, we've experimented with that as well with other species, and I think it's very promising. Um, but for the time being, our rules state that to document spawning habitat, we have to find two eggs on the beach. And uh, these are just some examples in a very short area of how much effort that might take. And really what I'm trying to highlight uh, primarily is this uh, first example of where there's a beach that we surveyed uh, between 2001 and 2007, 24 times and only detected eggs once. And so it's a considerable amount of effort for us to survey these beaches to, to get a single detection in order to protect that habitat. Um, so the, the distribution can be very patchy in time and space. Um, and so we try to do the best we can to document where it is. But there's over 4,800 kilometers of shoreline in Washington state. And my team consists of me and four biologists. And we're also responsible for uh, managing and monitoring over a half dozen species of forage fish. And so, um, we've had to rely pretty extensively on partners to help us do this work. So fortunately in Washington state, forage have, fish have many friends. And so this is a, actually an incomplete list of all the different organizations that have assisted with forage fish research uh, in various ways, actually just in the past decade while I've been at the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how some of these partners have helped just in very broad terms. Uh, hopefully just to sort of get the conversation started. Um, but uh, the partners that we work with have uh, focused some of their efforts on leading restoration effectiveness, effectiveness and monitoring activities. Um, so uh, beach restoration, uh, primarily focused on shoreline armoring or bulkhead removal, has become a major priority in uh, Puget Sound and Washington State because uh, a large proportion of our shorelines have been impacted by these types of activities. And uh, one of the major questions that we have pertaining to these restoration activities is whether or not they work. Uh, and so some of the marine resource committees and the citizen scientists that we work with have taken upon themselves to do before and after monitoring at sites that they know that are uh, planning to be restored so that we can establish a baseline for forage fish egg distribution, abundance, and survival before and after the activity so that we can start to understand what projects are being the most effective. Our sampling partners are also helping us to fit, fill data gaps. Um, many of the marine resource committees and citizen scientists groups that we work with uh, don't have access to a lot of beaches, but the beaches they have access to, they're willing to sample on a very regular basis. And so several groups that we work with have uh, agreed to sample 
beaches, the same beach using the same methods uh, for the past five years and continue to do so. And uh, this figure uh, just as uh, one of the tables we've uh, created to describe some of their efforts. But um, all the uh, uh, surf smelt codes and sandlands codes, SS and SL, that are have a, a asterisk next to them indicate that that's either the first time that that species was found uh, on that particular beach or the first time that it was found within that month. And so the timing is important to us because our regulations actually set time frames for work windows. So knowing when those beaches are occupied is pretty critical to our regulations. And I think potentially most importantly, our sampling partners help to educate the public. Every time they're doing surveys on the beach, uh, they are equipped with enough background information about forage fish to essentially give a, a brief seminar on the type of work they're doing, why that work is important, and why these species are important. And uh, I think this is really critical to uh, have that level of public engagement because it's far too easy to overlook these tiny fish and even easier to overlook the tiny eggs that they leave on the beach. And so we need the public support to protect these fish and their habitat. And I, I really do think this is probably the most important element of the, uh, the partnerships that we have with some of the citizen science uh, organizations. And so, um, the reason that we've been able to do this is that uh, in recent years, we've, we've modified a few things and had some uh, changes to our structure. So we, we currently rely more on non-fish and wildlife surveyors than we ever had before. And uh, one of the primary reasons for this is that we've developed and uh, uh, updated our methods. Um, so a lot of the work that has been done in Puget Sound was developed, uh, or it was done in uh, using methods developed by Dan Pantilla. And uh, we still use most of his methods, but one area that we've improved upon is the, the winnowing method that some of you might be familiar with using this, uh, this blue bowl uh, we call it the vortex method, uh, which has been very effective at uh, getting consistent results uh, across users. Um, we have greater egg extractions and we have less lab processing time. And so this has given us a lot more confidence when working with uh, citizen science groups, both in their ability to provide consistent results and our ability to train them. Um, we've also updated our data infrastructure. Uh, we now use digital data forms for data collection, which reduces the amount of time that my staff have to spend reviewing data forms, correcting data forms. Uh, there's fewer errors because we are able to use GIS built into iPads to collect the data. Uh, we're able to collect images to validate where and when and how the surveys were collected. And we're also having faster data processing turnaround time uh, because we get those, those survey results the same day. Um, we're able to get that data updated and onto our map more, more quickly. And uh, finally, it, you know, working with volunteers and citizen scientists uh, isn't free as some people would like to think. There is a, a significant investment that has to be done for both the group that are, that's uh, organizing them. And it's, it's been worth it for us, um, but we do work, we have some dedicated fish and wildlife staff as well as Washington Conservation Corps interns that work with our, our volunteers and, and uh, other partners. And we provide training uh, at least annually, but sometimes more frequently. Uh, we help with coordination to ensure that everybody's on the same page. Uh, and some of the partners at the Northwest Straits uh, Commission have been very active in that as well. And we also help to validate the results since these are used for regulatory purposes. We want to make sure that they are meeting our data standards. And so we uh, QA, QC, the samples provided by or uh, collected by these groups. And uh, with that, I'll take any questions if we have time. Yeah, we've still got a few minutes here. Um, don't have any questions immediately coming up in the chat. Philip, have you had, uh, can you speak to any um, initiatives about uh, cross-border exchanges of knowledge and, and different training that's happened between groups across the border? Um, I am aware that we have had some cross-pollination beyond just this group. Um, you know, I was really uh, pleased that 
Jacqueline and Cliff actually came across, or at least virtually across the border to present on some of their Sandlands research to our Puget Sound Ecosystem Monitoring Programs Forage, Fish, and Food Webs Work Group, which uh, is still talked about today as one of the best attended mini symposiums that uh, that entire organization has put together. Uh, we actually maxed out WebEx at 100 participants. So um, the uh, there's been that level of cross-border participation. Um, I've been invited by the World Wildlife Fund to uh, help train uh, using our methods, some of the surveyors that I think um, are still out there in BC doing surveys for surge melon sandlands. And um, yeah, I, I, uh, I, beyond just the beach surveys, uh, there's also a cross-border collaboration on a herring uh, I'm trying to draw a blank on the name of the report, but there's a, there's a Salish Sea wide uh, herring assessment and uh, threats evaluation, essentially. Great, thanks. Just had a couple other questions pop up in the Q&A here. Um, are there any other forage fish species besides sand lance and um, surf smelt in Washington? Yes, uh, we have a fair number. Um, Actually, the largest part of my job is focused on herring. Um, we consider Pacific herring to be probably the uh, most important forage fish as far as uh, the uh, ecosystem component is. But uh, in recent years, we've had a pretty dramatic uptick in northern anchovy abundance within Puget Sound. Um, we also have night smell, which occurs rarely, but does exist in Puget Sound. And uh, my team is also responsible for uh, assisting our Southwest Fishery Science Center with uh, monitoring sardine abundance. Uh, we had had previously had had uh, sardine fisheries in Washington State, not in Puget Sound, though, just uh, on the other coast, but those are currently closed. Cool, thank you. Um, another question here about what is the data collection app that you use um, and what were the considerations around selecting that app over others? Uh, we use the iForms app. Uh, which works, uh, at the time it worked on iPads, but I believe it works on both platforms, Android and uh, um, Apple products now. And uh, it was, um, there weren't many products available at the time. The, the other one that I know people have used is uh, Survey123, which I believe is a Esri product. And I've heard good things about that as well. But at the time we had some in-house expertise, familiarity with the iForms app. And so the, our first form was developed using iForms and uh, that's what we're stuck with. How are we for time, Stephanie? <laughs> uh, we've got less than a minute, but half a minute or so. Oh, a quick follow-up from Will. Is iForms free, Bill? Oh, sorry. I'm in my office and they've given me the signal that they're going to lock me in. Um, <laughs> uh, it, as I understand it, it is not free. Um, I believe our agency has a, uh, I'm not sure if you'd call it a membership, but we you know, essentially purchased a certain number of licenses and uh, we've you know, reserved a certain number to share with our, uh, our sampling partners. And really quickly, because I, I know you're probably going to log off soon, um, maybe we'll just ask answer uh, Yogi's question there. Do, do you also do pelagic surveying as part of your programs? Yes, um, we've done some. Uh, recently, we've been trying to develop a, an ichthyoplankton survey to document the uh, timing of anchovy spawning in Puget Sound uh, and the distribution. Um, when we're working with the uh, Southwest Fisheries Science Center, we're typically doing acoustic trawl surveys uh, off the coast of Washington. And uh, we've also previously done acoustic trawl surveys for herring spawning, or for herring in Puget Sound, um, but uh, it's become less regular due to the funding restrictions. I should also mention that we also have Yulicon smell, I believe commonly called hooligan. And uh, we do surveys, ichthyoplankton surveys for those as well, those as well, and also some fishery sampling. Great. Um, I guess with that, um, please, you know, if you if you have any other questions for Philip, uh, feel free to put them in the chat, and uh, and he can he can answer them there, or we can forward them on to him later. Um, with that, we're at about an hour into our uh, symposium here. Uh, maybe we'll just break for a quick. 
five minutes, um, quick wash and break, water, anything you need. Um, and then we will come back here for some updates from some of our stewardship groups around the Sailor Sea. Um, so with that, yeah, we will see you at 8.07 and, uh, and resume this thing. Thanks.
Okay, welcome back, everyone. We'll keep this uh, this thing going here. Um, next up, we have Alana Vivani from the Mount Aerosmith Biosphere Research Institute. Um, and she is going to be sharing the results from, from their program, as well as uh, taking kind of a lens of focus on volunteer training and retention. Uh, Mabry has been a, a real leader uh, within the network um, and in terms of sharing a lot of the training um, and, and making sure uh, the quality assurance is there. So thanks so much, Alana, and uh, take it away whenever you're ready. Awesome. Are we seeing the right screen so far? Yeah, that looks that looks great. Perfect. Okay. Uh, thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Alana Vivani. I'm a project coordinator at the Mount Aerosmith Biosphere Region Research Institute, or MARU for short. And I'm coming to you today from the unceded traditional territory of the Sine Malt First Nation. So thank you for having me. And as Kyle mentioned, I'm going to talk a little bit about community science and the Forge Fish program. So the monitoring program came out of the need to reduce data gaps within British Columbia on the location and timing of spawning on our beaches. Monitoring spawning habitat can provide crucial data that may enable some evidence-based decisions to be made, such as modifications to policies and management plans that can help protect spawning habitat. Um, the knowledge that BC has regarding windows and preferential site characteristics for spawning was primarily adopted from the work that was completed in Washington State. And as we heard from Phil's presentation, there's extensive work and research that's being done over there around forage for spawning throughout Puget Sound. So, you know, I think a lot of the hope is that through the BC Forage Fish Monitoring Network, we can follow in those footsteps and expand on the established program that we have in place. In BC, um, Ramona DeGraff, as you might have heard before from a few other presentations, um, she was integral in conducting beach surveys throughout the Strait of Georgia and doing extensive ground truthing of suitable habitat. So a lot of her dedication to forage fish and the advocacy is what allowed the current organizations to gain such a dedicated network of volunteers who participate um, in monitoring month after month, year after year. So big kudos to her. The BC Forage Fish Network um, is a really all encompassing network at the moment. And this is just a small snapshot of who's involved. Uh, it continues to grow um, each year and or each month really. Um, it has allowed organizations to share resources and ensure that we're continuing to cover more of BC's coast. And really this work has been achievable through the help of citizen scientists involvement. So many of the organizations listed here host their own network of citizen scientists who conduct um, a bulk of the sampling and the processing. For MABRI, our program began in 2017 with Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And I believe, I wasn't there, but I believe this gentleman on the right here is actually Phil. So shout out to him. Um, after some of our methodology modifications to better suit the research needs and getting comfortable with sampling and processing and analysis, we opened up this program to involve community members. Um, our goals were to have volunteers adopt local beaches where they could partake in the methodology for spawning habitat monitoring. Citizen scientists would collect samples from the beaches each month when the suitable was, sorry, when the sediment was deemed suitable. Then they would process their samples by way of sieving to narrow down the sediment required for our next step. Um, from there, they would vortex the sample to isolate sediment that eggs could be attached to. And the remaining sediment left over would be provided to Mabry for analysis through a dissecting scope. Um, thanks to the funders that we had at the time, we were able to equip each of the groups with their own sampling kits and processing kits. Now, Mabry has found really great success in approaching community stewardship groups when looking for citizen scientist involvement. Um, generally, these groups have an interest in environmental research and education, and in the past have worked alongside many other organizations to conduct projects that are aligned with the same values and goals that the Forge Fish program has. Um, members of the groups are generally local and they're being able to conduct research within their own neighborhood allows to foster that sense of place and sense of community. 
Um, not only that, but their knowledge of the land has helped determine sample locations, and many of which show positive detections. Um, our first intro to community science and forage fish was with Gabriel Island Shorekeepers Association on the right there, and Thetis Island Nature Conservancy on the left there. Uh, these well-established groups value the natural ecosystem around them and already work towards education, conservation, and stewardship on their respective Gulf Islands. And working closely with them allowed us to iron out details on developing citizen science-specific methodology that would allow interested parties to participate in environmental research um, with any background. Since collaboration with GISCA and THINK, MABRI has been able to expand our network to include a variety of other environmental stewardship groups on the island and the surrounding Gulf Islands, like Mid-Island Vancouver Habitat Enhancement Society, Qualicum Beach Stream Keepers, Couchin Valley Naturalist, Couchin Estuary Restoration and Conservation Association, Pender Island, Saturn Island, and uh, Tr Transition Salt Spring Island. So these groups cover a large portion of sample stations under Mabry's umbrella and have contributed to the majority of our positive detections of Pacific Sandlands eggs. Um, additionally, we've also reached out to secondary schools and that's been a great opportunity to engage youth in environmental monitoring and education with the help of eco clubs and environmental focus curriculums. We can incorporate forage fish monitoring into high schools and spread awareness to a whole new demographic. Once we've established relationships with the groups are interested, we schedule training sessions. And here our team would present on the program, the species of interest, the importance of monitoring, and how their involvement contributes to overall project goals. Then the remainder of the training session would be a going in the field to work on step by step on how to fill up the data sheet, conduct the actual field sample collections and processing, which then they would continue month after month. And one of the tools that we developed over COVID was a video, and this helped as we couldn't meet people in person, and it still serves as a good tool to this day when we are um, giving people refreshers. There's been a development of a guidance document by WWF Canada, um, as well as our citizen science methodology that's available online, and this outlines each step in site assessment, data sheet requirements, sampling, processing, analysis, data management, and best practices. Um, our data sheets also have a companion guide on the back that helps volunteers on the beach remember what each of the field on the front of the page means and how to collect and record the data. We provide region specific sample station guides that provide details of each beach station that in that region. Um, it also has beach characteristics that we noted on our visits and guidance on how to access the site. We've utilized newsletters like the Mount Aerosmith Biosphere Region newsletter to spread information of our program and also have an avenue for people to contact us to be involved more. And Forge Fish specific newsletters like ours, The Forager, or Peninsula Streams is The Schooler is also a great tool to spread awareness, engage volunteers, share results, and recruit new members. So just as an overview of what Mabry and our citizen scientists have done, we've been working since December of 2017. We cover uh, a large range on Vancouver Island, Bowser to Cowichan Bay, as well as Gabriel, Lathetis, Pender, Saturna, and Salt Spring Island. There are 117 established beach stations. Um, we've collected just over 1,700 samples since then. And we have 37 beach stations on 31 different beaches where we've found egg detections. Um, those are all Pacific Sandlands. And some of our more notable finds, other than eggs and birds, have been um, giant Pacific octopus, some nearby, you know, intact deer skulls, and uh, unfortunately, a California sea lion that was dead. So nothing alive, but some cool dead finds. And I just want to give a quick little shout out to all of our volunteers and our funders who made this possible. Uh, my email is down there at the bottom if you want to get in touch with me. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Alana. Such a, a breadth of work that you folks are doing and looks looks really great. And we appreciate your leadership, as I said, in, in, a, in kind of refining those methods for us and sharing those methods and, and training events. So it's really great to see 
Uh, Stephanie, were there any questions for uh, for Alana there? There was a quick one. Um, I think an interest in the approximate cost of the sampling and vortex kits. Right now, I believe our processing kits run around um, seven hundred dollars. And for a citizen wow. science version of the sample kit, which comes with multiple containers and jars, um, it runs about $70. So things get a little bit pricier if we work on um, the environmental professionals methodology as we need to include things like compass, clinometers, stadia rods, GPSs, stuff like that. So it can range. Right. right. 10 times the cost difference. Like that's, that's pretty crazy. <laughs> yes. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you, Alana. Uh, with that, I guess we'll move on to uh, Project Watershed um, and Virginia. Uh, if you're able to share your screen. Perfect. Thank you so much. And um, just mentioned that Project Watershed uh, is co-chair for the BC Forge Fish Monitoring Network um, and have put a lot of work into the, uh, the administration of the network, uh, as well as putting together this uh, symposium. So thanks uh, for that and, and uh, take it away, Virginia. Thanks. And I believe you're all seeing the presentation screen now, correct? Yeah, it looks great, Virginia. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Alana, for that inspiring presentation on the citizen scientist work and the foundations of the network. My name is Virginia East, and I am Project Watershed's citizen science and outreach coordinator. Tonight, I'm gonna to take you on a journey through some of our adventures in citizen science this past year. I would like to acknowledge that Project Watershed has a memorandum of understanding with the Comox First Nation and their Guardian Watchman program. We work closely with the Comox First Nation on all of our projects, as well as some of our beaches fall within the Wee Wee Kai, Wee Wee Kum, and other First Nations in the Northern Salish Sea area. Project Watershed beaches, our most northerly beaches include Manson's Landing and Rebecca Spit on Quadra Island. And then we travel south down the coastline of the Northern Salish Sea to Hornby Island and, and, and various beaches in between. Moving in closer to each of these locations, we have Manson's Landing as a beach that's sampled regularly by Friends of Cortez Island. And then they also have other sites in the area, such as Smelt Bay, Shark's Bit, and Moon Road. In the Campbell River area, the two core beaches that we focus on are Frank James Park and Oyster Bay Shoreline Park. Then closer to the Comox Valley, we have Air Force Beach and Goose Spit, and we have three sites at Goose Spit. Then there's a bunch of little beaches in between Air Force Beach and Goose Spit, and we only sample those when we get to blitz season. Our southern site is Hornby Island, with Conservancy Hornby Island being our core citizen scientist team there. From November 2022 to February 2023, we had 40 volunteers put in over 350 hours of their time. This included a total of 65 field events at eight core beaches, 25 blitz sites, and two new beaches on Hornby Island. To our amazement, this is our interesting find. Over that time, Cortez Island found 3,548 Pacific Sandlands eggs while the Comox Valley, which includes the Campbell River area and Hornby Island, found 105. I went out and asked our volunteers, what were some of their memories of the sampling events? Friends of Cortez Island shared their educational display with us. And if you have a chance to go up to Cortez Wild, the Natural History Center at the Leanna Farm, I strongly encourage you to go up 
and check out their display. Here are some of our citizen scientists braving the elements and collecting data using the qualified environmental professional method. So they're right in this image, they're collecting the tidal elevation. They brave the elements trying to keep their fingers warm during those cold winter days and got the occasional splash. They worked as a team and are amazing. One day we were out sampling and we discovered that the beach was 25 plus centimeters in depth in seaweed before we could even find the sand. The other highlight of our winter sampling season included braving the winter elements. This included an early morning sunrise where there was hoarfrost on the seaweed, in the sand and on the rocks, and it was just after a snowstorm. Cortez Island braved a snowstorm as well in, to sample sand. And they found on this particular sampling event, they observed a wolf while out sampling. Again, snow was a key part of our sampling this past winter. And they are, I'm very proud of my, the citizen scientists to go out and collect in the sand. In collaboration with Project Watershed, we work closely with North Island College. Students taking second year ecology under the leadership of Georgie Harrison actually do a lab on forage fish. And then over the course of the rest of the winter, they can support us in hunting for eggs under the microscope. So this is one of the students who spent a lot of time looking for eggs this past winter. As we move forward, things that Project Watershed in collaboration with the BC Forage Fish Monitoring Network would like to see happen is continuing the intertidal sampling of forage fish throughout the BC Salish Sea, developing and continuing our training and supporting of up and coming groups, update outdated coastal map data and maps, develop a pelagic forage fish habitat model, and uh, build in restoration activities for either habitats that no longer can support forage fish due to things, such things as hard armoring or where there may be potential for forage fish habitat if restoration occurred. This project would not be possible without the numerous community connections, including Conservancy Hornby Island, Friends of Cortez Island, the Comox Valley Nature Group, funding from the Sitka Foundation, volunteers from Landway, Greenways Land Trust, the Hakai Institute, and the Discovery Passage Aquarium. If forage fish is an inspiring thing to you, I encourage you to get involved with your local community sampling forage fish uh, because baseline data allows for the collection allows us to understand stand how beaches change seasonally and temporally, facilitating tracking changes over time, especially in the cases where habitats may be impacted by development. I'm now going to turn the presentation over to Jen with the Pender Harbor, Harbor Ocean Discovery Station to share about a case study in forage fish. Thanks so much, Virginia. That looked great photos there. Great photos and narrative of the uh, the volunteer efforts. Um, mm -hmm. Jen, if you'd like to share your screen, and do I we sure have hope so. Questions, Stephanie, for for Virginia in there anywhere? Or are we? Uh... No questions, but I think folks are very impressed by the dedicated volunteer effort to go out and sample in the snow. A lot of comments. That definitely. So we'll to yeah. Do. Very cool. Okay, uh, Jen Blankard from uh, from Pods on the Sunshine Coast. Um, yeah, just uh, sharing about about that region and, and what's happening over there. I think this is uh, some interesting finds. Thanks, Jen. Thank you. So everybody can see it and hear me. We're good. Oh yeah, looks great. Excellent, fabulous. All right. So yeah, my name is Jen Blankard. I am the field research uh, supervisor with the Loon Foundation which is the umbrella organization for PODS, the Penda Harbor Ocean Discovery Station. And I was just gonna share a little bit about 
our findings, um, some of the things that are happening in our area and our in our beaches. And I just want to take a moment and say that uh, we are located in the traditional territory of the Seashell Nation. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh oh. Uh -oh. Hold on. Sorry. Okay. Phew. <laughs> Um, so this is the overview of our organization. So the Loon Foundation, as I say, is the umbrella. Uh, we have a nature reserve center. We have a bookstore that that uh, um, we sell um, clothing and books for profits for our charity. We have the Ocean Discovery Station, which is not built yet. It is well on its way. Um, and while we're waiting for the building to happen, it's going to be a marine education center. We have come up with a monitoring program. So we have 10 programs currently running and Forage Fish was one of the first ones that we started with in 2017 uh, with Ramona de Graaf. So kind of an overview of where we are located. Pender Harbor is um, connected to the mainland. We're not the island. And uh, so we do Pender Harbor and Thormanby Island in the Salish Sea. And so we're gonna zoom in a little bit more and take a little bit of a look at our site. So, the top sites are the Pender Harbor region and the bottom sites down are um, on Thormanby Island. So zooming in a little bit more, this is the area that we've kind of covered um, in Pender Harbor so far. Um, inside the harbor, uh, there is not a lot of a lot of sites. It's mainly mud inside the harbor. Um, but outside, we've, we've done a lot of expensive um, surveying uh, to where we can get to by car. Uh, so this year, we're hoping to try and access more by the from the water this year. And then this is Thormanby Island. Um, so we get there by water taxi. And there's there's two areas, uh, the North Island and the South Island. And we started sampling at the gap uh, between the North and South Islands. Um, we sampled there for three years. And we've had a few detections over the past few years. Um, during one of our blitzes, I think it was two, 2020, we moved up to Vocroft and we found eggs, our first sample event up there. So we've changed our study site now to the to the north with checking in at the gap during the blitz times. So we have sampled 32 beaches in the past uh, five years, and we have found eggs at least once at 11 of those beaches. Um, of those 11 beaches, three of them have had repeat spawning events. So we expected a, it to be more, more common. So it was really interesting to have only three out of them that have eggs every year. So the first beach that I'm going to talk about is uh, called Smelly Goat Beach. Um, this beach has no official name. And uh, it's locally called Smelly Goat Beach because there used to be a farm up there and a goat fell over the cliff and nobody could retrieve it. And it was pretty smelly for a little while. <laughs> um, so this beach is located through private property. It is not uh, publicly accessed. Um, we've been very lucky to have permission to go down there. In the summertime, lots of kayakers will, will come in and use it. It's a beautiful little tiny pocket beach um, that's really sandy. And you can see it kind of follows a cyclical pattern of a, of a big year, a small year, a big year, a small year. And the other beach is Bowcroft. And unfortunately, I can't see my grass. I have uh, everybody's picture on there. <laughs> um, but this one is, uh, like I said, we moved to the north part of the island up into to Bowcroft and on Thormaby. And so this beach is used a lot more than um, Smelly Goat Beach. There is a pier and a water taxi and it is beautiful white sandy beaches all the way around and it is utilized um, intensely in the summertime. It's a, it's a popular spot to go for, for people. And uh, so the first year we found a few, uh, the second year, a few less, and then again, another, another big year. So same kind of, same kind of cycle of a, of a big year, small year, big year again. And then we get into Baker Beach. So this beach was one of the first beaches that we ever sampled. And in our very first year, we got eggs. It was, it was incredible. We just started. And uh, so the first year we had a few and the next year we had over a thousand. Those thousand eggs came from one day. They were all one day. It's not a compilation of, of eggs throughout the season. 
And then the next year we had it go down and the next year we had it go down and the next year we had it go down. And then last year we thought we were gonna have a zero. And so we started looking at it and we were trying to figure out, well, what changed? If all the other ones are following kind of a cyclical pattern, why is this one different? So this is Baker Beach in 2018. It does not have a lot of sand normally. The sand is all up in the upper uh, high intertidal. And then there we have two transects at this beach. Um, so this would be looking at the first transect and the sand is all up, like I say, they're up by the logs. And it's generally cobble. Um, the back shore has an eroding ridge. There is a residential house that you can see um, there's stairs leading down to the beach and they put in a, a platform there for a deck. So this was the first year that we started sampling. This was 2019. So you can see the hard armoring now along the back shore. They did put in a sandy beach um, at the end of their stairs. And then there's a lot more woody debris in this picture compared to to 2018. And like I say, we, we thought that uh, we were going to have our big zero for Baker. Oh, sorry, long slide. Um, so going back to our graph here, you can see here is here is the number of eggs. And that is where the hard armoring occurred. So interesting. And uh, like I say, in 2022, 2023, we had a zero, we thought. And then just outside of the spawning season in March, on March 21st, we found uh, one egg. That's it, just one, random. And at first I was like, oh, it's gotta be herring. It's not herring, <laughs> it's a sand lens. <laughs> so interesting. So the hard, the hard armoring, it's like screaming that it must be the factor, but is it? Is it the only factor? You know, we have studies that say that we have impacts of shoreline on Pacific sandline habitat. We know that it changes the dynamics, but what about, what about the heat domes that we've had? What about the unusually cold winters? Like we don't normally have so much snow here on the coast. And I mean, we've been buried two years in a row. <laughs> Granted, so was Storm and the Island and they were able to figure it out over there. And obviously same as on Cortez. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, so that, and then we don't even know the normal cyclical pattern. Maybe Baker is different. Maybe it's boom and bust. Maybe they throw out this big year of eggs and then it cycles out and then they're going to do it again. Maybe there's too much woody debris. That was another thing that you could see in this. Is something happening to the adults? Was that the problem? Did the adults not come back? We need to look more. We definitely need more data. That's what is, is screaming here. And the way that we do that is through our monitoring and research. And so I just wanna highlight that, you know, everything that these groups are doing, we, we, have, we don't have the answers. And every time we go out there, we're building a better picture and we're gaining more insight. And all these groups are doing incredible work and us being all together and sharing it's going to make it so that we can we can start to really look at what's happening and hopefully uh, start protecting these these beaches, these species, and and make some good changes. And uh, so I want to say thank you and highlight my volunteers in the in some of these pictures here. Um, they they are the backbone of our organization. That's the only way we get anything done is through <laughs> these guys. So I just wanted to say thank you to them. And thank you for listening. Wow, great presentation, <laughs> Jen. That's really wonderful. Um, and what a great and you know, interesting case study. And and yeah, just such a convoluted picture. Like who knows, right? Like so many factors. Just ask Jacqueline. <laughs> yes. Um, no, that's really wonderful. Um, do we have any uh, lots of questions or comments in in the uh, lots of comments? Uh, are there any questions, Stephanie, that I missed? I haven't seen any specific questions uh, for Jen come up. Okay, well, yeah. Again, feel free to um, to enter those into the chat. Um, without further ado, I'll I'll jump in on uh, Insula Streams presentation here. Um, 
It says I'm screen sharing. Can everybody see that okay? Yeah, yeah looks great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so Peninsula Streams and Shorelines. My name is Kyle. I'm the Restoration Coordinator. Um, we have our beach program, which was kind of formalized in 2018. Uh, we do regional beach cleans, um, uh, as well as forage fish sampling, uh, eDNA monitoring, all throughout uh, Greater Victoria and the Saanich Peninsula. Um, also, you know, uh, known as the unceded traditional territories of the Lekwungen peoples, so known today as the Esquimalt. Uh, nation in the Songhees Nation, uh, as well as uh, the different Wasanich groups. And we, we work quite closely with a, a number of these groups, uh, as well as their kind of marine and stewardship teams, some of them here tonight, which is really great to see. Um, and in particular, SACOM Marine Stewardship, as well as at Sartlip up in the uh, Wasanich territories. Um, our programs, and in particular, what we really like about the Forage Fish Monitoring Program um, is that it kind of fits within our pillars really well. Uh, we try to have programs based uh, across three pillars that are looking at research and advocacy, education, outreach, and stewardship and restoration. And beach, uh, our beach program and the forage fish monitoring uh, works really well uh, within that. Um, I've just had my mouse run out of battery, so I'll plug it in while I'm talking. Hopefully it comes back online. Um, yeah, and so that's a great filter for our programs. You know, as we're training folks uh, to learn about the beaches and the ecology of the beaches, they in turn become advocates for the beach um, as well as stewards. Uh, and they also, you know, create the sentiment that's required, uh, the kind of political context uh, and conditions for restoration and for greater stewardship. So. Our beach program, and in particular, this forage fish monitoring has been a very powerful program for us um, in terms of, of these three pillars. Um, just a quick uh, highlight of our numbers. And again, um, you know, everyone is, is uh, giving huge props to volunteers, and I, I have to do the same. We have a wonderful, wonderful base of volunteers across our region, dedicated out there, sampling at night in the snow and the storms and the dark. Um, you know, and just putting up these incredible, incredible numbers over the years. Um, and we've also had a number of, uh, of, of really great coordinators of the programs. Uh, Austin Nolan has, has recently taken the reins and has done an exceptional job of, of uh, keeping the volunteers organized and, uh, and with working equipment and just doing all the things that uh, required to to keep these volunteers going. So huge thank you to the volunteers and to the uh, and to Austin for for the work that's been going on. Um, since 2018, we've we've done about 881 samples uh, across 99 beaches or 156 sites, 156 sites with over 180 positive detections. So we've we've really been able to kind of spread our effort across the region um, and with all the help of these different volunteers. Uh, in the past, and, and this map kind of shows where we've had our finds relative to those efforts. Um, and in the past year, so this is the past year, um, we've done 190 sites. Um, we've identified 23 new sites, which is always a, an important stat for us, which new beaches are we identifying as habitat? Um, so this was a, a pretty huge um, a year for us. We've also, um, gotten really good at finding eggs. Um, we've seen the photos of the network. We're finding a lot of surf smelt eggs on our beaches um, with, you know, detection rates of up to 22% this past year. So um, either our, our volunteers are getting really good at finding them and sniffing them out, as well as um, we have some really special and, and productive smelt habitat here, um, as well as Pacific sandlands. Uh, the smell detections are, are fairly unique within the network, so we, we know that this is kind of an important area for them. Um, and in particular, up in that North Saanich region in, in CM Harbor um, and, and Roberts Bay, uh, this has been a, a really productive area for us uh, with lots of beaches kind of lighting up, really high detection rates. Um, and we're beginning to view this area thanks to the, this work from the monitoring network as kind of this bastion or this extremely productive area for surf smell. And, and so we're really turning our focuses up there. And again, working in, in close collaboration with SACOM Marine Stewardship 
uh, on, on identifying these beaches, as well as our volunteers and, and the Roberts Bay residents and, and different stewardship groups uh, to identify these beaches and, and look at some of the impacts. When you look at this area, you can see a lot of uh, a different story. It, it, it's a really highly modified bay, um, lots of marinas, lots of different land use changes, um, lots of hard armoring. Um, there's one beach there known as Tryon Beach that that is kind of a really strong indicator beach for the for the region in terms of surf smelt and we get year round spawning at that beach um, and it's just an incredibly productive habitat. So we're really taking a lens at, at this area just due to how important it is eco ecologically um, and trying to uh, increase efforts and focus to protecting some of these areas. Um, I mentioned the seawalls. Uh, Jacqueline has, has, there's been a lot of talk about seawalls and this uh, concept of, of coastal squeeze. Uh, we've worked with, uh, and I've seen on the call, uh, members of Pacific Salmon Foundation's uh, Resilient Coast Project, um, uh, who have been mapping a lot of these seawalls in the area, which is really great data to have for us um, to target restoration as well as conservation efforts as well. But essentially, these seawalls are, are acting as a hard line, uh, interrupting the kind of ability of these marsh and beach systems to adapt uh, to sea level rise and increase storm surge. So for us, these seawalls, um, and was evident in Jen's presentation, um, lots of nods to the, these bulkheads and, and what we can do to prevent them from going in the first place and then also potentially removing them. There's also uh, lots of other issues in Seam Harbor that are kind of ubiquitous around here. So logs and contamination, stormwater outfalls and pollution, armored shorelines, that, you know, other than bulkheads, but just riprap and then just failing back shores. So lots of issues that can be addressed through restoration. Uh, Peninsula Streams has a little bit of history doing some, some beach nourishment and, and shoreline restoration projects. Uh, the, Patch Bay, the Pat Bay Beach Nourishment Project, uh, which was done in partnership with the Sacred First Nation, Ministry of Transportation, uh, as well as DFO, um, and Peninsula Streams. Uh, basically, what we were able to do was, you know, in looking at this progression of the shoreline from, you know, historical conditions where you have this really nice kind of dune sand back shore with forested fir trees um, and uninterrupted zones with nice sand beaches that are good for people, but also uh, fish and uh, and and spawning. I, <laughs> Uh, probably. Um, but with the building of the highway and the harm I mean, that shoreline, uh, a lot of those materials sort of disappeared and, and were scoured and you get a kind of a different substrate mix that you see in that 2009 photo. Um, and so one of the treatments that we use is nourishment where we kind of find an anal analog source of, of what we'd like to see on the beach, um, a clean alluvial source of sand and gravel, and we nourish the beach uh, with this material. Um, so that was done across many different phases, uh, many thousands of tons of material brought in. And basically what I want to drive home is that our, this monitoring uh, program has really allowed us to uh, to monitor our work here and, and have ongoing monitoring at this site. So with, with that monitoring, we've been able to detect surf melt detections and, and kind of indicate some level of success at this site. So we'll continue to monitor this uh, into the future um, and, uh, and, yeah, engage our success thanks to the capacity that's being brought by the, this program. Another restoration project we're working with, again, with the Resilient Coast for Salmon folks from Pacific Salmon Foundation, as well as the BC Stewardship Center, and our friends at the uh, Songhees Marine Stewardship and Esquimalt Marine Stewardship groups is the Songhees Walkway Pocket Beach Restoration Project. Um, essentially, you know, historical conditions on the right, um, anthropogenic fill, the whole area was completely filled in, um, and we're left with this kind of much less desirable site on the left with kind of failing shorelines and armor, uh, not a lot of habitat for, for spawning fish. So the idea was to come in here and do some nourishment, clean up the, uh, the black shore, back shore, do some uh, marine riparian plantings, and, and engage with as many folks in this project as we can as kind of a demonstration site. So the first phase was completed last uh, last year, and we were able to remove, um, you know, a couple of dump trucks loads of, of aggregate or sorry concrete and asphalt, and uh, and basically fill and bring in kind of a, a clean alluvial uh, sand and gravel mix that was uh, has been tailored to kind of suit the conditions of the site, which are quite high in, in energy, um, as well as uh, biologically, you know, suitable for forage fish to spawn in. Um, it was a pretty good success. It, it looked quite natural. It looks quite natural. 
Um, and uh, we were able to complete that first phase. And we did some sampling with uh, Songhees Nation as well as the Squamalt Nation's marine stewardship teams. And we were able to detect that within almost four or five weeks, smelt had been using the site to, uh, to spawn on. So there was a, a really, uh, we weren't expecting that. This was more of a training exercise than opportunistic at the site. And lo and behold, we found some eggs. So it was a huge, you know, uh, hurrah moment for us. Um, and we look forward to completing the second phase uh, this spring, which will include kind of further excavating into the back shore, more nourishment with more kind of suitable substrates for, uh, for smelts and Pacific sandlands and uh, planting of the back shore. So just um, again, how this uh, project has been able to lend capacity uh, to these types of projects, allowing us to monitor our efforts, um, as well as engage and bring people in around projects with these opportunities to, to monitor and have a look at and learn and understand. Uh, finally, we're currently engaged in developing uh, a project that's a marsh restoration project, which will involve some nourishment. Um, a marsh has been eroding in Roberts Bay in the North Sandwich Peninsula. Um, and again, this is part of that effort where we've identified kind of a hot spot for smelt, um, looked at some of the impacts around seawalls, um, and a basically, you know, we took an analog uh, uh, sediment sample and did a sediment sieve analysis to basically from a really good habitat on the bay um, and are basically going to be able to rebuild this marsh using that sediment type um, so that, you know, one will be able to plant and reform the marsh. Uh, but as that marsh erodes and, and kind of within the dynamic system that it's in, that material we can track and follow as it distributes throughout the bay and can be used as a, um, as a substrate for spawning by surf smell. Um, there will be some kind of rock crescent sills that will go out on the leading edge to protect that material as it goes in to kind of help stabilize it. But as we said, it'll be dynamic and a lot of these um, sediments will, will be mobile and nourish some of these uh, scoured areas within the shoreline. Uh, we have lots of different partners, including the World Wildlife Fund, uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada. We're working close collaboration with the Sacred First Nation on this one, uh, Marine Stewardship, and uh, as well as some engineering partners and the Institute for National Research out in uh, Quebec. Um, there's some kind of photos of what this treatment might look like uh, with kind of a, a probably a larger nourishment mix in behind there, a little bit higher energy site than uh, what these depict. Um, finally, you know, with great thanks, um, particularly from the sea monster of McMicking Beach, uh, photo credits to Bud Sebastian for this one. Um, this is from a very productive smelt beach. Uh, he came across what looks to be a very terrifying monster, the mimicking monster. But uh, with that, thank you to our volunteers. Thank you all for coming out tonight. Um, and thanks for listening to that presentation. Let's see if my mouse is dead. Okay. And uh, Stephanie, are there any questions on any of that? There were some great questions that um, Alana and Virginia have fielded, um, mostly around um, how are these beaches selected? Are these beaches selected um, under guidance? with like historic information from First Nations. And then the follow-up question to that was, um, how and when do you decide when to switch monitoring from one beach site to another? Yeah, it's a, it's all kind of a, a, and those questions were answered. I'll take a quick stab to, um, for our programs, you know, we're kind of on the one hand, monitoring beaches over time and getting a good idea of what, how these beaches are, are being used over time. But at the same time, uh, looking to, identify new habitats because as we know these areas are, are being developed quite rapidly and are changing quite rapidly and um, and this data is being used by a lot of uh, local and regional governments in particular their planning departments um, it seems to be uh, getting more and more on people's radars um, so I, we we kind of do feel like there is this mentality to identify as many beaches as possible in terms of you know where are they being used and what is habitat um, to, to, to be able to inform the, a lot of these management decisions and policies. Um, and that we think there's a huge role uh, for uh, local citizens to kind of be involved in their OCP process and, and take a hard look at what policies are being put into place around the shoreline. Um, and, and that kind of, because the coastline is so uh, complex, there's so many levels that 
uh, can be done on beyond the local government level. But um, for us, yeah, certainly uh, engaging on the local level and, and policy on that is a, is a big deal. That's my ramble. Um, are there any other questions that we can ask before we get on to awards and prizes? Uh, a couple more that have just now popped up in the chat. Um, does uh, does PSS use eDNA? Um, yeah. PSS habitat use? We used eDNA um, as part of Cliff's study uh, earlier on. And then I think we took a break from it. And then we've just kind of gone back with uh, with HackEyes eDNA programs. Um, and so we have, a, we have a number of beaches that we're surveying um, as well as, you know, uh, I think Sea Change monitors through that program, as well as the Shaw Discovery Center. So we're getting pretty good coverage. Uh, oh, and Surf Rider, pardon me, too. Um, we're getting pretty good coverage along Greater Victoria and the peninsula in terms of eDNA consistently. So monthly, monthly sampling in our area. So thank you to Hackeye. I don't think I had them in our, in our slides, but thank you to Hackeye for supporting that, that program. Because it's not cheap, but with them it's free. So I highly recommend that program. Um, so it looks like people are kind of uh, addressing questions through the chat, which is great. Um, Stephanie, if I give you a drum roll, um, or maybe I'll give a quick a quick uh, background. Tonight we have a, a prize from Arcteryx, um, who have kindly, very generously donated a, a backpack. Um, for one of our uh, attendees this evening to win. So um, without further ado, we've kind of taken a list uh, from, from the meeting um, and we will randomly generate something, or we have, but uh, drum roll. Yes. <laughs> I've got a random generator here queued up and ready to go. So I'm going to hit generate and we'll see who we get. Oh, that's so exciting. Drum roll. That would be uh, Jacques, and I'm sorry, I'm going to mispronounce this, Servois. Jacques Servois! Yes. <laughs> yeah. From the, uh, the Friends of Victoria Harbor Migratory Bird Sanctuary. What a yes. win. And that guy rides. Congratulations. So yeah, that is fantastic. Jacques, I will be able to give you that backpack the next time I see you. Um, great. That's, and you know that's what you get for asking so many questions, I guess. Um, wonderful. So yeah, uh, this meeting will be recorded. Um, I think we can extract the chats and answers and stuff like that somehow. So I'll try not to bumble that. And, um, and yeah, we can, we can share this among our networks. Um, there, yeah. Uh, other than that, I think, unless I forgot something, anyone, maybe we'll let everyone have their, their nightcap. Okay. Thanks so much, everyone, for tuning in, and um, yeah, enjoy the evening. And, and thanks, thanks to all of you for uh, caring about the coast and forge fish. Thanks, everybody. Bye. Thank you.